Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Luann Rogers, the president and CEO of the Corville Communities, a long-term care system in southern New Hampshire. The Corville Communities include two nursing homes, assisted living communities, and retirement departments. The Corville Communities is a private, family-owned organization, something that is becoming less common as corporations have come to dominate the competitive landscape. In this podcast, Luann talks about her 30-year journey through a field that has gone through many changes. Her career began as a nursing assistant in Chicago, Illinois, working to put herself through college, and has included working for privately owned facilities as well as national chains. I really enjoyed my conversation with Luann. Her passion and commitment to the field is remarkable. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. Also, I'm excited to announce that we are now getting the podcast transcribed thanks to a financial gift from the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Thanks for listening, and here is Luann Rogers. Welcome to The Forge, Luann. Thanks for having me. You went to Loyola University in Chicago, and you earned a BS in psychology. Why did you choose Loyola and why psychology? There's sort of a long answer to this one. (laughs) I'm the oldest of six children in Chicago, uh, being the oldest and a girl, very traditional Catholic family. Uh If I was going to go to college, I had to figure out how to do that. So Loyola was a place I could go as a day student, essentially riding the bus in the L. I could also afford the tuition, being an Illinois State Scholar and having worked as a nurse's aide and saving money, I could afford to go to Loyola. Okay. So that's how I got to Loyola. So you put Loyola. yourself through school? Oh, yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. Because I always thought it was interesting because my brothers went to Purdue. Uh-huh. I don't think they put themselves <laughs> through school. <laughs> and I'm probably, of the four girls, there are two boys and four girls, I'm the only one who went to four-year college. So that's how I got to Loyola. Okay. And why psychology? I liked it. I mean, I went to, when I went to Loyola, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was good in math and sciences. Um, I liked those. But then I took some psychology courses. I was actually started as a nursing student. So I took all the anatomy and physiology, the organic chemistry, the physics. I figured I did all the hard stuff first, (laughs) which was a lot of fun. Um, But then... Since I was paying for it, I was also trying to figure out how I could graduate in less than four years. Oh, okay. So a psychology degree allowed, allowed me to do that. Okay. And, and you were working as, an, as a, a nurse's aide nurse at the same time. Yeah. So did you kind of know right away, even while you were in school, that you might want to work in I think I, I knew I liked health care. Okay. Um, the floor I worked at worked on as a nurse's aide um, was a geriatric floor. Oh, okay. Just kind of interesting. Uh-huh. And, Foreshadowing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Never, when I was sent up, sometimes you floated and you would go up to different floors and I, I liked my geriatric floor a whole lot, so. Okay. That was. What was it about it that appealed to you even back then? Um, I think you could talk to your patients in a way that they had history, they had I got my first apartment through one of my patients. <laughs> I mean, you know, okay. Things like that, that you can make those personal con- connections. And uh, that, okay. was, that was so nice. So after you graduated, you came to Exeter Healthcare in Exeter, New Hampshire, and worked as a certified nursing assistant. What brought you from Chicago to Exeter? I got married. Ah, okay. And my husband had a job at Phillips Exeter Academy. Okay. Uh, so... We moved into a dormitory with 80 boys, oh, wow. fourth floor apartment with 80 boys. Um, I wanted to get a job in as a social worker somewhere. I okay. went to Exeter Healthcare yeah. when they had an opening, but I had no experience. So they didn't hire me for that. So uh-huh. I said, well, I've been a nurse's aide. I can do that and figured I could work my way 
up as they got to know me. I could learn more about long-term care in New Hampshire. Um, so you kind of knew you wanted to do long-term care. Yeah. So Exeter Healthcare was that? That was, was a, a long-term care oh, center that the okay. hospital operated. I see. It's since they've since closed their Don't long-term care okay. beds. Okay. But and then I was also lucky enough to work with a, a director of nurses at that center who said, you know, even if you can't grow here, I happen to know the people down at Goodwins of Exeter, okay. and she knew they were a company that was growing, and said maybe that's a place you should. And that was, in fact, your next stop. That right? was my so next stop. You yeah. stayed at Exeter for a fairly short period of time, and then you were hired uh, as the Director of Social Services and Activities at Goodwins of Exeter, which I think now is Sunbridge Goodwin. It's now Genesis it? at okay. Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you, you said a second ago you had kind of already decided you wanted to do some long-term care work. I, I just really liked... Um, working with the residents and the families. It, okay. it just clicked for me. And I think either you have a good feeling about working with the elderly or you don't. I, okay. I firmly believe it's not like McDonald's. Right. You know, right. everybody can flip a burger probably, but right. not everybody can work in long term care because you're caring for people and you have to have some connection. So you felt that. Yeah. And, and, and so you. So tell us, tell me, tell me a little bit about the director of social services. What was that? What was that role? I sort of back in the day, nursing homes thirty years ago were are significantly different than they are today. Yeah. But um, that was the role that did all the admission work. So you met all the families when they first came in. You were then responsible for quarterly notes and working with families through everything from financial applications for Medicaid or understanding the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and I also oversaw the activities department that put on events and acti the activities for the residents. So I had a, a few staff members who would work and I would oversee them and do their notes for them, for their documentation. Okay. So how many people were you supervising at that Probably time? two or three at that okay. time. So a small team, yeah. but, but a supervisor right away pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you were the director of social services for and activities for about four years, and in your fourth year, you began to do administrator and training. What does administrator and training refer to, and why is it important in the nursing home community? Well, first of all, to be an administrator in the state of New Hampshire and in most states, it's a licensing activity, and part of that licensing is an AIT in almost every state in New Hampshire. It's a one-year process, and the reason the New Hampshire Board requires a one-year process is they want someone to go through a full-year cycle of events in a nursing home, whether it's budgeting, your survey, how cash flows, how, how admissions flow, um, as well as to get to know every department that you're going to be ultimately overseeing. So. That's what an AIT is. Some states, Massachusetts, I believe, is a six-month AIT, but almost every state wants you to have that hands-on experience that gives you that exposure. So it's kind of an on-the-job training. Yeah, and, and you so have to do it under um, an administrator who has been an administrator for at least five years in a facility. Uh, I believe it's more than 50 beds here in New Hampshire. So. You know, you, you, you're then paired with a, a mentor almost right off. So someone at Goodwins must have looked at you and said, Luann's got potential to be a leader <laughs> to, to do this. I, well, part of it, I think, was also that Goodwins was the first of the facilities that the Clipper Homes grew from. It was a family-owned single facility, and that owner partnered with another man to develop the Clipper Homes. They were a growing company. When I was hired, they were building the Clipper Home of Portsmouth, so they were already okay. growing. So they needed to grow their own people so they could, for example, the woman that I worked with moved to the new building, and that's how I became the administrator of the building. I see. So, so uh, as you just said, uh, you became the administrator in 1984. What does the role of the administrator encompass? Lots of stuff. <laughs> That's probably the, the, I think it's probably the most interesting and challenging job there is because no day is the same. Okay. It's not boring. 
if, if an administrator tells me they're bored, I kind of wonder what the hell they're doing <laughs> because you do everything from HR to you need to be smart clinically and be able to oversee your nursing department and know all of your residents. You have to collect the cash. You have to make sure your building's done correctly. You have to make sure your folks get paid and all of the HR kind of components of managing a team. Yeah hits you every day and you don't know which one of them will be the most important that day. But it's, you know, you, you're part of the marketing team out in the community, so you're involved in events outside of your facility. You are accountable for your survey results, so your state and local rules and regulations have to be monitored so that you're not surprised that yeah. to be found that you're not compliant. Uh, how many people were you responsible for? How, how big was your team? It, yeah, Probably about a hundred people. Wow. Yeah. So you went from supervising a team of two or three to now being responsible for the entire operation with a hundred people. It's a, it, it's a huge yeah. jump. It, it didn't feel like it because okay. you, you got to, because I was already working in the facility. Right. I think that was one of the pluses. I got to know everybody as the social worker first. So it didn't feel as awesome of a jump yeah. as, as yeah. it were, but... Um, I think it was, you know, it's all about relationships that you build in the building. And yeah. so it didn't feel as intimidating, perhaps. Okay. You had some nursing experience uh, and you had experience in services and activities that we talked about a second ago. But now you you were responsible for the entire operation as you were talking about all the different functions. What was the, what was maybe the most challenging part of making that adjustment? I would probably have to say the HR or the managing of people okay <laughs> um because it's one thing to be responsible for yourself and what you do but when you are interacting with up to 100 people or more you have to change how you do that you have to figure out what makes that person good at their job and how to keep them motivated and on task and doing what what you've decided as a team your goals are so yeah. That was probably just trying to figure out how that how that fit. And it's probably an ongoing thing that every manager continually learns as they move along is everybody's different. You can't treat everybody all the same. And if you want them to be on your team, you have to figure out how how to make that work for both of you. At what point did you decide you were really committed to long-term care? Pretty early on, yeah, I would say. Like yeah, um, You know, I think it probably, I knew both of my grandparents when I was a kid, so, and they were always over for dinner, and my, gra my uh, Austrian grandmother made some of the best meals, and we copied. I still have, I still have a party every Christmas with my team, my uh -huh. administrators and my administrative team at my house, and I make my grandmother's Hungarian chicken paprikash. Ooh. It's really good soup. And <laughs> once I tried to change what I was serving for lunch, yeah. and there was a revolt. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to let your people down. Yeah. Um, so Goodwin's, as you said, was, was kind of the core. Uh, it was uh, the first. Uh, it was uh, actually for... named after the man's grandmother. Okay. The owner's grandmother. So. Okay. so it was the first of the Clipper. Affiliates. Affiliates. Yeah. And, and that's relevant because, you, as you said, they were building the Clipper home of Portsmouth, and you actually went from Goodwins to the Clipper home of, of Portsmouth. And this is uh, was a, a significantly larger facility, it sounds like. Yeah, as, the, as he developed the company, he thought, besides a nursing home, assisted living and independent living would make some sense. Okay. So the Clipper home of Portsmouth, which is now... The Clipper Home of Portsmouth. I think it, it still, still has name. that name, but okay. it's a Genesis facility. And Genesis is just, since we're going to, we'll talk about yes, that. Yes, Genesis it's, is the big dog in New Hampshire. They're the okay. largest owner of uh, and manager of facilities now in New Hampshire. Okay, and they're a national they're organization. They're a, a they're national. Right? Yeah. They are everywhere. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll talk a little more about consolidation. In a yeah. Um, so what I saw was it was a 92-bed facility. So previously you had good ones was 81 beds. This was a 92-bed nursing facility, 32-bed assisted living facility, and then a 26-apartment retirement community. So what was that like making the jump again from just managing a single facility to managing three different kind of levels of care 
were they kind of different buildings as well? They were all, you could walk from one building to the next. They okay, were so set up in close. a, yeah, um, but they were separately licensed, or at least the assisted living yeah. uh, was, but and the na we named the independent living uh, Langdon Place. So, okay. and that as an independent facility, it had um, studio apartments and it had one and two bedroom apartments. And it was independent living, but a congregate independent living so that folks would come to meals in a congregate dining room. There were activities for people to participate in, but not it was at their discretion. They had their own mailboxes. They lived okay. independently. We just added some congregate supports, as it were. What What does congregate mean in, in the just in that the they were all they lived together okay. in an apartment an apartment building essentially uh -huh. that offered dining and activities, which okay. would be different than just out in your community. How does that differ from assisted living? Assisted living. Um, there are two levels of assisted living in the state of New Hampshire with rules, 804s okay. and 805s. Um, they are a step, care is provided at both levels, but the 805s allows more care to be provided by caregivers. Okay. Um, people so often say 804s are more of a social level okay. um, of care where people, again, living in congregate, maybe not apartments, but more... Um, rooms with congregate space where they gather together for meals. In 805s, medication can be passed. More care can be provided. So the regulations that govern those are different. Right. 804, 805. Yeah. So 805 was the higher level of care. Right. Requires different staffing. What, what is it that's different about the requirements? You have to have enough staff to meet the needs of your residents, okay. <laughs> so it <laughs> leaves it kind of wide open and it's up okay. to you as the manager of the facility to figure out what that staffing level is. But it usually means for, for us at Corville, we have a nurse around the clock and nurses' aides who staff the building. Okay. And we're 805s. Okay. And so. that's the assisted living. Yeah. You stayed two years at Clipper Home and then you moved to Clipper Affiliates, which is the corporate level offices right where you were the vice president for operations and then four years after that you took the pre president role uh, what was the scope at that time of clipper affiliates back at that time okay. <laughs> in new hampshire there were ac most of the facilities were privately owned family owned facilities there were the mccurleys who sort of had all the buildings up the 93 corridor dwight sowerby um, was another owner and he sort of had 93 West, 101, Keene, Peterborough, that direction. It was interesting how the state divided up. Dick Corville had the Manchester, Nashua area. Ray Lemire had some Manchester facilities. And the Clipper affiliates and Bill Gilmore sort of had the 16 corridor. Mm -hmm. um, and the Clipper affiliates at that time was the organization that grew the facilities. We went from two facilities to the 10 facilities. Wow. Um, and were you there during that whole yes. period? Yes. So I, what I did that was different is not only did I oversee each of the facilities and the managers of those facilities, but I managed the administrators essentially, not the teams in the buildings. But I helped them, all the strategic planning, the CON process, the stuff. Certificate of need. It just is the way a state controls the number of beds in the state of New Hampshire. So you'd have to get permission. You would have to apply to a board who, and it was often competing, so you wouldn't necessarily be the only, you'd have to start with the state would decide there, there was a need for beds, so they'd put a request for proposals. And then people would come out to compete for it. And... That process could be months long. It depends on how many people were involved in it. And then ultimately someone is awarded the certificate of need that would contain the building costs because you had to pro project what your building costs were. And part of the process was to for the state to control the number of beds and the reimbursement of the, how many beds the state would be responsible for. Okay. 
uh, that process does, is that that no longer exists in New Hampshire, does it? Did, it did, just did it sunset? sunset this year. Okay. But before it sunsetted, many of the restrictions on controlling the number of beds moved to another agency. So. Okay. So there's so still, still, still state, state level, level control over the number of beds. It's, that's the way the state controls or can contain its budget commitments. Okay. So you were the president for five years. What was that like? So you said you were now managing the administrators mm -hmm. rather than the people. How, how did your leadership have to change when you took on that level of responsibility? I guess it just, the people changed and the okay. people I had to deal with. And while mo previously it was all just the people in a facility, now it was multiple facilities but also external bankers, stake agencies, and you, you just have to figure out how to in relate with them to get what your company's goals are and what you needed from them. So as the administrator, as an administrator of an individual facility that was part of Clipper Affiliates, you were able to stay focused internally for the right. most part. You said you did some marketing yeah. and things like that. But. As the president now, you're dealing with a lot of more external stakeholders. Absolutely. And okay. It was kind of fun to meet new people. <laughs> yeah. So after serving as president for five years, Clipper was acquired by Sunbridge Healthcare Corporation, and you served another 13 years as the regional vice president for operations. How was the decision arrived at to sell uh, the system to Sunbridge? The owner said he was done. Okay. When the Clipper homes were sold to Sun, we were not in the Medicare business. We just had private pay. We had pretty much been a private pay with Medicaid facilities. And I was convinced that we wouldn't survive without adding a Medicare component to the business. And he did not want to get into another government program. And so he said, it's my time to step out. And that's what he did. So, so you had made the analysis, in order for us to survive in this new environment, we've got to engage Medicare. Right. And he, he, he saw said, that and said, that's something that's, that would be interesting. Yes. He, okay. He just didn't want, he thought Medicaid was nasty enough to deal with it. He didn't want <laughs> anything else. And he okay. doesn't know how good we had it back then either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so part of the factors were the... The, the owner was just not interested in kind of making that next that next step. Yeah, and it was time for um, him. It was also the time that many, as I said, of those other families yeah. were selling. Okay. McCurley sold first to Genesis. Okay. Dwight Sowerby sold to Harborside, which you'll see. Okay. Clear so, that it all yeah. comes together. But so was this this was this the point where a lot of the lot families of the just decided it was time to leave the business. Is that because the business was changing because of things like Medicare becoming I think necessary? It, yeah, and they were... What was kind of driving this acquisition I think there were more... Process? There were big companies who wanted to grow as well, so okay. they were making good offers to those folks. Okay. So, so. it met, okay. you know, the needs met. Okay. Um, what was your role in the acquisition process? So this is, you are the president at the time. That it went yeah, so we, had, we were working with a financial company to set up all of the documents that you need, but I was the point person to answer any operational questions. I did all the tours, and I went on tours to meet people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We often, you know, you often hear when, a, when an organization is acquired, senior leaders are kind of shown the door, but you stayed on. You were asked to stay on. Not only that, you kind of became... Uh, I was told in my, in my first year that it wasn't likely I would survive. And I thought that was just kind of, oh, after the first year, that it was uh -huh. rare that I had survived. And I, I was kind of surprised by that because I didn't understand. It was different than working for an independent, family-owned, one person you'd go to if you needed an answer or you made the decision yourself to having many people telling you what to do but there were a lot more resources as well okay and i think at the time sun was growing they couldn't afford to throw people out they 
I mean, I met with the leadership that I worked for before the company was sold and was offered a job so that I think I interviewed for the job essentially. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I didn't find it a hard fit. They, there were more resources for us to use. Can you give an example of what kind of resources came available to you as well, a result of being part of a larger corporate structure? There was someone to call if you had a legal issue. There was someone to call if you had an HR issue. There was someone who processed your payroll. I mean, we were doing payroll ourselves. So, I mean, it was, there were just more people. In some ways, it freed up your time so you could focus more if you were in a building on patient care. Okay. That was... So there's a con some economies of scale, scale that were, were available. That, Maybe that ju partly justifies the, the ongoing consolidation. Right. I think that's what it's all about. It's The more you can spread those resources out over more facilities, it just becomes more economical. And I didn't find it. I found the people that I worked with at Sun. We went bankrupt, for God's sake, in the oh. middle of it. Forgot, <laughs> God, forget that. Oh, okay, part. I didn't know that. Oh, we did. We okay. Did. Yeah. But we came out much better, and okay. all of the senior leadership changed in Sun. Okay. But I, I was blessed with a group of 10 facilities that I had nurtured and grown. I knew all of my managers. We were one of the best regions the company had. We always met our targets. We volunteered for every kind of new initiative to try it out first because we knew we could break it the best and figure out how to make it better. Um, and it just, it worked. So Sun, uh, Sunbridge later acquired Harborside Healthcare Centers and those facilities came under your control as well. Yes. Right? And, and you said Harborside, where was Harborside buying? Sowerby. Sowerby, Sowerby sold to Harborside. Oh, Harborside was, was a smaller regional company. It wasn't a national company. Okay. And, and those were the units out in, in the West. west. Okay. Yeah, so they Keene, that area. They, we had one in Keene, but now I had more in Keene. Okay. <laughs> and Peterborough and Milford and Bedford. Okay. Yeah. Wow, so now you're physically spreading out because oh, you're... North Clipper Conway been, yeah. to Keene. Wow. So all kind of the... Eastern, northeastern, and then all the way for from listeners 101. Don't really know 101 that. West. I was 101 West. <laughs> so uh, basically, all of, of Southern New Hampshire. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, but now we're more we are more mixed with some of the or some of Genesis facilities okay. were and. Okay. So you stayed with Sunbridge for 13 years until 2010 when you left and became the tri-state district director of operations for Kindred Healthcare. What is Kindred Healthcare and, and where is that headquartered? It's another national chain. It is a company that would have been comparable to Sun at the time. It since has gotten out of the long-term care side of business. It's oh. doing more subacute and hospital-based markets as what well. What does subacute refer to, listeners? And yes, um, subacute would sort of be between the step uh, being hospitalized in acute care, higher intensity care is subacute than long term care or rehab care. So more nursing, more, more PT. PT, more physicians are on site, kind of. Okay. But anyways. But at the time. Time Kindred had was is a national company. It still okay. is a national company. It's just, and when I moved to the tri state, it's because my husband became the headmaster of a school in Connecticut. Oh, okay. So it was so, a geographic decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I thought product. for a short time that I could, we kept our house here in New Hampshire, and I could just go back and forth. It's only three hours away. Right. That was insanity. It was <laughs> <laughs> at the height of okay. insanity. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so what were your responsibilities? Uh, what was so, so what was your scope of responsibility as the Tri-State District Director? Tri-State was a misnomer when I had the Tri-State because it was only Connecticut and Massachusetts facilities. Okay. I think there might have been Vermont at some point, but not when I not got the Tri-State. And then I, so I had facilities in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Okay. And then you were promoted to be the Vice President of Operations for Northern New England. How did that change your scope and, and responsibilities? Well, then, after we moved back to New Hampshire, um, and my husband retired, lucky him, sort of, sort of retired, I should say. <laughs> and 
um, try and then the northern New England had facilities in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Okay. I had 25 facilities between Bangor, Maine, Burlington, Vermont, and the Berkshires of Massachusetts. That's a huge region. Truly. <laughs> How did you, how did, so, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, I mean, well, it's hard to drive to, that in a day. You can't drive it in a day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was, Kindred was trying to become more efficient and traditionally regions were about 10 or 12, maybe 15 buildings um, to go to 25 makes your life just a little crazier um, just to, keep track of 25 buildings and monitor everything from their senses to their quality indicators to financials. You became, I found I became less connected to the buildings with 25, even though I drove to all 25 of those buildings, um, but not as connected to the buildings as I was when I had a smaller region. You did more communication and I think that that puts more distance between you and the people and it's harder to manage when you you're on a phone and you can't see what there's how they're looking at you right, right. <laughs> um, but so you were fo focused much more on metrics yes and, and not, by metrics uh, yes and I tend to be a more people person so that okay. made me a little more challenged okay um, so so you you were there uh, for three years. Let me back up a second. Were there any differences between working for Sunbridge and working for Kindred? Did you? Can't say. No. That there were. I would probably. I think there are little differences between the big companies. Yeah. Um, but I can't say. Mostly operate the same. They do. Kind of. Okay. You know, maybe your financials look different. Sure. Maybe your dashboard of information that you get looks different. But the expectations as a manager are. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. It's a pretty simple business in some ways, but. So you left Kindred in 2013 and came to the Corville communities to be the president and CEO, which is where we are today. Yes. Um, what led you to leave Kindred and come to Corville? The man who had my job before me, okay. um, Henry, Henry LeBlanc, um, had been the president of the company, this company for about 15, 18 years, something like that. Um, and he came to the company um, at a point where he put many more systems, management systems into the company, but he was ill. And Henry knew me from his first days here at Corville because his expertise was more business and not health care. And he would just call me. He'd just call me and ask okay. me the question of, who do I call for this? Or I'm thinking of hiring so-and-so. Do you know them? What can you tell me about them? Um, I would just answer his questions. Seems like a, nice. a nice a, thing, to thing to do. I mean, it's yeah. a, that's a nice thing about New Hampshire, if you ask me. It's... I think even though it's the competition, as it were, yeah. we all just want to do what's right for the patient, so if you can help, help. So Henry and I had a relationship early on, and when he um, became ill and knew he needed to step down from the role, he picked up the phone and called me and said, would you be interested? And I have to be honest, at that point, I was kind of done with the big companies. And, okay. Um, also a region that had 25 buildings. And I also saw that Kindred was starting to downsize, and I kind of wondered if uh, if I'd have a job right. in the next couple of years with them. And it just seemed like the right fit at the right time. What kind of corporation is Corville? Is it a nonprofit? Is it it's for-profit, okay. family-owned, great little So company. it's private. It's yeah. not a publicly traded no. company. Okay. No. One owner. Okay. Been in his family. We're, we're almost to our 50th anniversary. Um, his father built the first the first family nursing home. It's the Fairview down in Hudson. And then he had two boys. One boy got Fairview, and his father helped him build the, the Corville at Nashua. And Dick grew the business from the Corville Nashua. He built the two assisted livings and the Corville. The CON process, he got 
the beds to build the Corville of Manchester. I see. Okay. And that's how he grew his business. Okay. So when you interviewed for the position, you interviewed with the owner, I assume. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. And Henry. And Henry. Okay. <laughs> But Henry knew you for yes. a long time. So yeah, and I and, and I knew Dick as well through the healthcare association, through some C O N competitions. Um, so <laughs> sometimes like that. He, sometimes he was in competition <laughs> with right. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I always believe you never burn a bridge. Okay. You just can't. You can't burn a bridge. <laughs> okay. So before we talk about your role as president and CEO. Can you tell me a little bit about the Corville communities? We've talked about the fact that they're, they are, in fact, family-owned, so they're for-profit, yeah. family-owned. Yeah. Uh, how many facilities are we talking about, number of residents, so forth? We have four facilities. Okay. If you count the villas, we'd say five, but there's only two villas. It's two apartments, so okay. I'm not sure I'd call it a whole facility. Okay. Um, there's the Corville of Nashua, which is a 100 bed, and it's a straight nursing um, skilled uh, long-term care facility. Um, we have the other nursing home is the Corville of Manchester. It is 70 nursing home facility beds and 12 assisted living beds on the first floor. It does uh, short-term rehab and long-term care. And we have two assisted livings, the, Cor the Carlisle Place in Bedford and Ainsley Place, which you would, in Nashua, which is almost, you'd say it's on the campus of the Nashua facilities that you can, the parking lots connect. They're both 46-bed assisted living facilities. Okay. When we talk about skilled nursing, what does that mean? It's... We take care of sick people. Okay. <laughs> um, I would, one of the differences in, that I've seen in long-term care is that nursing homes used to be the long-term aging, aging centers. Now, a huge component of every nursing home is skilled care. And that means that you have a nurse around the clock and it, there's an RN around the clock. You have many nurses on your staff, depending on the size of your facilities. You take sick people right from the hospital who need everything from therapy, physical therapy, re um, speech therapy, or occupational therapy, but also um, their complicated medical conditions. Um, older people don't usually have one thing wrong with them. Sure. They usually have many comorbidities. So you might have a stroke with who is a um, congestive heart failure. So they're complicated care. So our nurses are there 24 hours too. And we, those short-term rehab people do go home. Okay. I think that's one of the things people don't really understand about what we do these days is it is rare that one of those short-term admissions stays with us. If we can help them get the supports to go back to their prior living, that's our goal, is to get them back home. So you've got several categories of, of patients that come to you, one of which is short-term rehab. Right. So how does one come to you as a short-term rehab patient? You, you come from the hospital because the Medicare rules say Medicare stay in our facility is only approved after three nights in the hospital. <laughs> so a Medicare stay in, in Corville yeah. is only approved if they've got three days in, yes. the, in, Any, the, in the hospital. To, to have Medicare pay for your stay in a nursing home, you have to have been in the hospital for three nights. And not just in the, not on observation, you have to have been in admission, admission okay. for three nights. Um, what's the incentive for the hospital not to just hang on to the patient and do the rehab in the, in the hospital? It's not cost effective for them. Okay. And we usually, and I would say our short-term rehab patients are with us between two weeks and a month. Okay. Usually, usually not any longer than that. It depends can on... You, can you give an example of what kind of uh, illness or injury would result in ultimately, or procedure would ultimately result in a, a short-term rehab stay that then would lead to a discharge? I would say any kind of broken issue, <laughs> um, so hip, okay. um, 
sometimes even knees if your knees are, are done, um, replaced. Less of that because now that surgery and that, that healing process has been, because of the techniques in the hospital and the surgical, lots of those people go home. Straight from the hospital. Straight from the hospital. So you got a knee replacement or a hip replacement. You're not going to come to us too much okay. anymore. It's only when you have other things wrong with you. The comorbidities. Yes, uh, whether it's diabetes or a stroke or congestive heart fail failure, uh, an infection. Um, you mentioned your wounds that aren't healing. I, they're just a lot of different things that don't make you a good candidate to go right home, but we can take care of you for a couple of weeks and get you to a better place to get there. You, um, you mentioned the kinds of care that are given in, in, in the rehab, PT, speech therapy, things like that. Yeah. Are those people, are those providers on staff or are they independent? And they for us, we contract with an outside agency. It's actually Genesis Rehab who provides our services. Some facilities bring, do hire them and have them on staff. Okay. Uh, it depends on what works best for your facility. Is there a global reimbursement arrangement? So when someone is admitted to Corville for short-term rehab, is it? It's a federal a program. We get paid <laughs> based on the care that we give you. So there is an assessment form called an MDS, a medical data set, that we have to complete. There are strict guidelines of for seven days, 14 days, and that score based on your MDS puts you in a category that gets, that determines what we get reimbursed. But if you're with us as a Medicare patient, that money that we get for you pays for everything. Your room and board, your therapy, your medications, it's an all-inclusive rate that we get. So okay. we have to manage your care efficiently when you come to us as well. So you get a single payment that is dictated by the the, the, the It's resident specific, uh -huh. but uh, it's... But if you spend more on PT, that comes out of... That comes out, uh, of, that, out and of that. So you have to... It's a more complicated patient to manage because you have to be aware of what the meds cost, how much therapy is being given, and do the right thing for the patient okay. to get them to their discharge goals. How is that different than someone that you admit for long-term care? Payment is, is either one of two things for long-term care. It's either private pay or it's Medicaid. Okay. Why not Medicare? Medicare doesn't pay for long-term care. Okay. Does not. Does not. That's okay. one of the, I think it's one of the misnomers that most people don't understand about when they're older. They think Medicare pays for everything. And especially if someone tells them Medicare pays for 100 days of care. It's rare I've ever seen anyone use 100 days of Medicare in one stay. Okay. It is usually a much more episodic kind of system, but it does it pays for nothing for long term care. Okay. So you were saying the payers it's for long term care, care are private pay, pay or, or Medicaid. Medicaid. What about long term care insurance? Do you see that influencing the A little industry? bit. A little bit, but not I mean, most of our patients are eighty five to one hundred and five. Wow. That not, are long term care. That are long term care. Um, and I don't think that age group was really buying long-term care insurance or knew much about it or it, I'm not sure how available it was. Yeah. And most long-term care insurance, as I have seen some of the policies, they pay a daily rate. They, you're insured for a daily rate that may or may not pay what I charge you. Okay. It, it's probably a supplement so that you don't, you're not paying the the full freight, as it were. Yeah. I think that's how I've seen most of the time people who have it have a policy that'll pay a hundred dollars a day or a hundred and fifty dollars a day towards your private pay rate. Okay. What is the ratio of, if it's okay for me to ask, what's sure. the ratio between Medicaid and, and I had to write um, it down. private pay? 
I, I, I always looked at it as my quality mix, and if you're a private pay or a Medicare or a managed care patient, I get fairly reimbursed. <laughs> Okay. That's how I would describe it. Okay. I would say most my two nursing homes run between 30, 32% Medicare managed care combined. Privates between around 30%. And then the rest is Medicaid, so 40. 40% Medicaid. Yeah. Now the Medicaid is going to be primarily the long-term care yes. patients yeah. or residents. Yeah. And then the Medicare would be only short-term stay people. Yes. And so then the private would be some combination of the two. But most of your private or your Medicaid patients will can be a, have Medicare reimbursement if some if they go off to the hospital and come back. So okay. they can have so access to that that benefit as well. Okay. Yeah. So well, I think one of the, one of the, our goals as a private family owned independent company is we have to manage the mix in our buildings. How do you go about doing that? It's all it's all in admissions work. Okay. Um, and we also commit to the folks who live in our assisted living facilities that if you've paid privately with us for two years and you run out of money, we'll take care of you in one of our nursing homes on Medicaid or whatever is appropri okay. appropriate. Um, so most of our Medicaid patients are self-grown. Oh, okay. It's the private pays who have spent down. We rarely admit a straight Medicaid from the community because we can't. We can't afford it. We we can't afford to do that. Where do patients with straight Medicaid wind up going in in Manchester or Nashua? Um, Is, are there state? Um, there's the county homes. Okay. They stay pretty full, too, okay. and they've also figured out they have to have run some Medicare business to stay afloat. I would say one of the benefits of having a large company like a Genesis is they can absorb more of that Medicaid population in their centers because of their how they spread their resources out. I think one of my frustrations when I worked for a big company is it seemed that payer source didn't matter when you did an admission. Sometimes they didn't even have a payer source, which kind of made me a little crazy. <laughs> because their view often was a, a head in the bed was better than an empty bed. And well, I think to, Even if there was a risk of not getting paid at all? Well, I think it often came down to, well, you as the administrator figure out how you're gonna get paid for it. If it's a homeless person, I don't think I'm gonna get paid is where I would always come from. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then you have to be creative in discharging and figure out how do you get that person, because one of the rules we live by is if they're your once they're your patient, you have to make sure if you're going to discharge them, you put them, take send them to somewhere safe for them. I so see. you have to have a safe discharge plan. How has health reform and in particular the Affordable Care Act affected the long-term care industry and the Corville community specifically? I don't think it's affected long-term care yet like it potentially will. It's not, we're not like Massachusetts, <laughs> thankfully, okay. where I think more, it, there's more influence down in, in Massachusetts. But New Hampshire stayed, has stayed out of it because as um, managed Medicaid has come into the state, for example, it's, it's for the at-home population. It's for, it has not yet stepped into long-term care. I think at the hospital level, hospitals are working to do more discharges directly home and then to community-based care. And right now, where the people, we, the age group that we care for, that was 85, is, is slightly depressing. That cohort is slightly depressing before we climb that huge mountain of baby boomers that yeah. will, will be eventually needing care though I don't think they're going to need as much care as the current, because people are healthier. Okay. They're living healthier lifestyles, and I think people are planning, perhaps, more for themselves. I think the days of families taking care of grandma and grandpa are long gone, because most families need to have two incomes to survive, and who stays home then? So. I, I don't think we've figured out as a state or necessarily as a society of how we're going to 
care for all those older people when they're because the number of caregivers is not growing as fast right. <laughs> as the number of people who, who need care. So you think people are aware of this fact and are making arrangements in advance? I, I'm hoping that some yeah. people are. I, I don't. I, I think in the state of New Hampshire there is a cap on the number of nursing home beds. So the state has some control. They don't pay us what it costs us to deliver care because. When, and when you say the state, you mean the state, Medicaid. Medicaid, but it's fifty percent state. The rest is the counties and the feds. So, I'll, okay. but it's the state side of the the budget that always hurts us. Um, what what happens is every facility submits the cost report of what it costs to deliver care to the state. And they don't pay for some things like your marketing and stuff like that. So even though there are real costs that you have, they don't even recognize those as real costs. And they decide, and based on that, they know how much it costs to deliver care. But the state only has a certain amount of money in its budget. And what they allocate for long-term care is a dollar amount. So they simply do what they call budget neutrality and cut 30% to 40% off of your daily rate, and that's what they pay you. That's It's that's, exciting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to know how much okay. that percentage is going to be. Yeah. It, if, if your census can take, if, if your mix is so highly uh, Medicaid and your rate drops $5 a day per patient, that's huge. Yeah. And it can swing that much twice a year. What is the Medicaid rate per day right now? It does it vary by, by It does vary acuity? by bill. It, it varies. There's an acuity factor that's part of that rate setting. It's not the big influencer. Okay. Um, budget neutrality is, is more of an influencer where the acuity portion when it came into our rate setting was to ha- to make sure that we were only caring for people who really needed care, because it would you would be disincentivized if they were light care people and on Medicaid. Well, we're way past that. We have sick people in our facilities because everybody who needs lesser care is in assisted living. The options are there, but it's budget neutrality that hurts us the most. So you have to understand that that that's a very volatile piece of our rate. What's the dollar amount roughly? A hundred and fifty dollars a day maybe. Wow okay so you have to run your whole facility, pay your nursing staff, pay for their food, pay for... And we are a employee-based business. (laughs) Right. I mean our, our biggest cost is labor. Right. You need housekeepers, you need dietary aides, you need cooks, you need nurses, you need nurses' aides, you need activity staff, you need your management staff. It's, it's a people business. Yeah. How, uh, does Medicaid pay for assisted living? Yeah, but... Even less? $46 a day. Okay. There aren't many Medicaid providers in the state because of that. Uh, yeah, in the assisted living yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what kind of living arrangement does Medicaid pay for in assisted living? So is it like a private room? Any any provider could accept Medicaid patient, uh, Medicaid reimbursement. And I think most often it's a private or a semi-private room, I'm going to guess. What does semi-private mean? Two people sharing a room in a bathroom. Okay. There are fewer and fewer facilities that can afford to do it for... There are some wonderful small providers who do it and bless them. Yeah. I don't know how they they do. The administrator is the owner who lives in the house and somehow makes it work. And I don't. They're, they're angels. <laughs> That's all I can say. Okay. You've spent 30 years in the long-term care industry. What makes a good nursing home or long-term care facility in your experience, in your observation? I mean, you've seen... Dozens of different homes and it's, work with them. I would say it's the people who work in the facilities. So, and lots of times you can tell it's a good building when there's longevity of staff in the building because that means the management is taking good care of their people. <laughs> and that consistency of staff delivers good outcomes for your patients. Relationships develop and good care is given. Running a facility is about, I always say, if you take care of your, your employees, they'll take good care of your patients. If those two things happen, your building will stay full because you'll have a good reputation, and then you'll, 
you'll stay financially solvent. It doesn't always work that simply, but yeah. I think it's a pretty good formula. And that it's you can there are scorecards, there are metrics that consumers can look at from um, the Centers for Medicare Serve so CMS. They have a, a scorecard that consumers and it's five stars that can tell you and the stars are based on staffing and surveys and quality indicators. You get stars for yeah. all those things. Okay. And that can, I would always say to someone, you can start there, but go to the building. Because if you don't go and meet the staff, you have no idea. It's a feeling where you're comfortable. It's just, that's how you, it's a gut thing in some ways because you you have to see if the residents are smiling. You have to see if the if your if the employees will greet you. You you know, <laughs> there's there's some gut things you can check. To Hard find. to measure. Yeah. Yeah, intangibles. Yeah, you know, we and we as a company try to do satisfaction surveys because I think customer service is truly what it's about. Again, taking good care of your residents, but it's not just our residents we take care of. We take care of their families as well. Sometimes you have the sweetest resident, and you could have the family from hell. <laughs> 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 okay. And you have Those to manage both of them, you know? Speaking of managing, so this is a family-owned facility. You have a single owner. How do you and the owner interact? How much is he involved in the day-to-day -day operations? I wouldn't say he's so involved in the day-to-day -day operations. He's usually here every day. His office is right over there. Okay. So we talk every day. I, he, he watches the census in our mix, as, as, as I do, because we know what that means for our, our business. You know, and any big things, I, I tell him about it, if I think it's something that, any big decision. What's a big decision? Capital expenditures we, well, or No, I get pretty much, if we're gonna re, if we're gonna, um, we have an entire facility. He has a. Yeah. If you saw one of our facilities, they're they're nice. They look nice, <laughs> and he takes great pride in providing a, a hotel kind of look. So he would want to have some input on the furnishings, for example, of of the facility. But he would let me narrow it down, kind of. Okay. Um, we just refinanced the, the company so that. I don't have to refinance it again, ever in my life, because it's for 40 years. Okay. <laughs> um, but he, he kind of let us take care of that, because now he doesn't, and it's um, no recourse on him, which means nobody can ever go after him for any money, but he can transfer to a new owner. It's HUD financing, so it, it took care of his needs, and I have a good interest rate, for the next 40 years. It's a long time. Oh my God. <laughs> Otherwise, you, most companies refinance every 10 years, and to refinance is a lot of work. Because <laughs> right, we're not talking about small numbers. No. <laughs> right. As the president and CEO, what keeps you up at night? So you're laying in bed staring at the ceiling. What are you worrying about? I think right now, I have great managers in my buildings, so the day-to-day -day management of them, I, we have good communication, so I, I, I have a great, great trust in them. Uh, but as a company, our biggest challenge right now is we're so labor intensive and the workforce needs for every provider in the state are huge. I think we've taken nursing programs. To be an RN now, you have to do a four-year BSN. We, years ago, there were the easier entries into an RN program, two- and three-year programs. So we have fewer RNs, we have fewer programs because the Board of Nursing has made it pretty st stringent requirements for instructors. We don't have enough instructors, so we, we cannot produce the nurses that we need. Nurses just move from job to job, as best I can tell. And then aides, yes, we can keep growing those aides, but if I can't pay an aide because of, I'm still dependent on my Medicaid rate, more than McDonald's or another, the grocery store, how do, I get, how do I get them to stay with me? I mean, right now I work to make sure I have great benefits, but, for even, but they live paycheck to paycheck. The, the AIDS do. The AIDS do in particular. And it's, it's a struggle to keep, and I'm, I'm a company that has great 
longevity. I threw a party for all of my employees who've been with me for five years or more of, for 160 people. Wow. So, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not the worst off, but that's a, a long-term problem. They're, you know, we're working with the legislature to try to figure out some solutions to that, but it's a, a people issue. Where do you find the people to come into our industry, okay. our profession? <clears throat> it's, and it's hard work. It's, it's hard to be a nurse's aide. It's hard to be a nurse. I think to be a nurse in long-term care on a skilled unit, you need more skill and knowledge and assessment than if you work in a hospital. Because you're not backed up by a doctor standing at your elbow. You are the eyes and ears for those doctors that you're going to be calling. So you have a lot of autonomy and a lot of skills, skill needs to work in, in one of our facilities. And that's hard. It's just a hard job. You make the call. <laughs> when you first took on the role of being president and CEO, and you've done this a couple times now, what, what surprised you most about that role? The best part is how quick you can make a decision and it gets, you can just do it, <laughs> okay. you know? Right. If, if you work for a big company, there is nothing that simple, <laughs> nothing that simple. For example, when I came to the company, we still had beds that you would crank. So we just bought all new beds. I mean, that was a great thing for our residents and our staff. And I could make that decision. It could happen quickly. The... The part that was more challenging was sort of the finance side of things and working through uh, refinancing was not my favorite thing to do, but now it's done. <laughs> it's, it's sort of that immediacy of being able to do the right thing for the patients. You know, my administrators can usually just call me and say, this is going on, this is what I like to do, what do you think? And, we can say yes, or okay. if there's a problem, we can solve the problem yeah. easily, okay. quickly. It's fun that way. Let's, let's transition and talk a little bit about leadership. What would you say is your leadership philosophy? Well, that one I have already put a lot of uh, thought into. Because when you're meeting new people, they want to get to know you and sure. what's important to you as their leader. Mm -hmm. But I believe I'm a coach first. Okay. I'm only as good as my team. If they fail, I fail. So my job is to make sure I give them all the tools they need, I coach them, I mentor them to be successful. At the same time, I know stuff happens. And what I want from a, any manager or leader is they learn from it. Because if they learn from it, I'm not gonna get rid of them because now they're stronger, they're better. They've, they've grown from the experience and stuff happens in our business. So it, when you're managing other people, you can't always be sure what those other people are gonna do. So there's stuff can happen. I think it's important that I build good trust and communication. You know, that I don't want, I tell everyone, I don't want to hear about it it's the last person, <laughs> okay? It's really nice with four facilities because a phone call away. I don't even need a conference call. <laughs> like they're a phone call away. So building that trust and that good communication. Uh, one thing that we're trying to strengthen with our facilities right now is consistency of policies. They, they had been allowed to sort of be four independently operating facilities and now I'm trying to bring them to more consistency in best practices. And I, they like that idea that they don't have to figure it out all for themselves. So I think that's a, another thing I, can, I bring that I want that consistency of. Is that something you learned working for the chains? Yeah, well I think part, the part of it, but I don't want to take it so far because sometimes I've, you could feel like the chains just want robots to implement their policies and healthcare is more of an art than that um, and how do they personalize it how do they train their staff to make it part of their what they do every day um, I try to make sh sure that we all know what our goals are what we're aiming for and then we communicate it 
regularly on how we're doing to our goals, whether it's our census, our mix, our survey results, our, this is our business plan for, for this year. That our surveys have fewer deficiencies than our competitors. Deficiency free is what we always wanna go. Um, one of our clinical focuses is on hospital readmissions. So we wanna be better than our competition that we don't bounce people back to the hospital. And we wanna see our customer satisfaction on our customer satisfaction surveys. We're trying to keep our turnover targets good so that we have low turnover. Um, we, had been, we had eliminated agency. It seems to be creeping back in because... Agency is short-term... From staff, yeah. Staffing, okay. Um, we work hard on our employee satisfaction scores, try and find out what benefits they want. We've created a culture club to, to work with our staff. Then managing our revenue and our mix and meeting our budget. Pretty simple. So we talk about that every month. How you do, how's your building doing? How are we doing as a company? So they get, they get to see that because one's not an island anymore. They get to, one can support. If one's down, the other one can help them, you know? Okay. Kind of thing. So there's some transparency within the corporation. There has to be. Otherwise, how do you get the buy-in? And that's my philosophy. How do you get leaders to buy in if they don't know what you're aiming for and that they are not kept apprised of how you're doing? And they should help you set the goals. Well, what, on, that, on that same uh, uh, line of thought, how do you, uh, what do you look for when you're hiring leaders and evaluating leaders? If I'm hiring an administrator, I want to know your caregiving background. I want to know what you've done that's cared for people. Because I've always, I can't teach you that. <laughs> I can't okay. teach you to care. But if you can talk to me about your passion for caregiving, some, you don't have to be a nurse's aide. You don't have to. But tell me what you've done that shows that compassion for people. Because at night, I don't want, I want to be able to go to sleep and know that you're going to make the right decision for that patient because you care about the patient. I can teach you the financial side. I can teach you the HR side. If I could learn it, I can teach it, right? But I can't teach you to care. And I, that's the first thing I, I, need, I need to know. What are the characteristics and behaviors of a good leader? And how do you aspire to those yourself? I think it's always about relationships and how, as a leader, I help other people be better people, better in their roles, better people in their roles. And I think it's, that's something I'm always trying. How could I be a better leader by being a better person in terms of those relationships and how I nurture them and making sure I stay, I understand, I'm looking for how they can be helped, not waiting for them to ask. I think for, for my leaders, I need them to be that too, that, that we're, they're comfortable working together and, and not wanting to be that isolated entity. And I, I think that's one of the things that we've struggled as a company to do, because they were used to being four independent people who did their thing. I'm like, hmm, that may have worked. <laughs> But, and it's been a, a change for some of those, of the four buildings, only one facility has changed leadership in, in that time. And that one leader went to, went to Maryland to go to get a PhD. What can I say? Okay. <laughs> Not because they were dissatisfied. So right, no. Right. And, and I think that's another thing that as a leader, if, if you're not performing to my standards, you're not going to know that the day I fire you or we decide to. It's because we've had a lot of communication and I've tried to help you and you know where you stand with me all along that process. And I've never separated from someone that's worked for me and we both didn't understand it was the right thing and a good thing for both of us. It just, if you're fair with people that way, 
it's again about the burning those bridges because you're never going to know who you bump into again. <laughs> <laughs> what is organizational culture and why is it important? I think the culture of a company is what binds it together, what, what, what everyone shares as what motivates them. We just went through a, a process of defining our mission statement. What, 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 do we do, what, what do we do every day? What do we want to make sure happens every day? And that, that in itself was, I think, great to bring the team, the, the leadership team to, to, and now we're spreading that out in the buildings with lanyards and keychains. But what everyone agreed our mission is, is to enhance the lives of everyone we touch. And it just seems so simple once, oh, you should have seen all the words we came up with before that. But that process in itself, I think, is creating and enhancing the culture of, of why people work for the Corville company and the personal touch part of it. Um, the process of coming up, up with, with that mission, mission was helpful in terms of yeah. getting people to understand. Because it, it, it took, we had to do little, uh, you know, we'd come up with something, we'd go back to the buildings and have a little group and say, what do you think? And, Nah, I didn't like that, <laughs> you know. Um, and this was one that everyone believed they did every single day and could get behind and wear a lanyard that said it. And so it, I think it, but that also motivates the creation of the culture club that we didn't. Somebody had a song in their mind, I'm sure of it, when we came up with that name. But it's doing things in each of the centers with, for the employees. For example, for back to school, the Culture Club came up with the idea of everyone should clean their closets and bring gently used clothing, shoes, lunch boxes, anything for back to school for other employees to go shopping for their kids. Oh, I nice. mean, just it's employees helping other employees but something that can be a costly and time-consuming event. Yeah. I mean, but there, it's, I, I'm also wanting to empower the employees to come up with those ideas, that it's not my idea all the time, because I tell them I just steal good ideas from other people, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'd like them to come up with some. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have men a mentor or mentors early in your career? that helped steer you toward this? Uh, well, I think work? almost every boss that I've had has sort of been a mentor. And uh -huh. I think what mentors can do is teach you some skills, but also help you form your own idea of what kind of leader you want to be. Because like sometimes they have bad I They do things you don't think you would want to do, <laughs> <laughs> or you wouldn't want to do it that way. Let's just say that. Okay. Um, and I. Yeah, so almost everybody, and I had a, it's Sun, the 13 years I was with Sun, I think I had nine bosses. Well. Most of them didn't last two years, obviously. It was kind of juggling, I had a couple of really good ones. Yeah. I'm thankful for those. Yeah. And they've stayed friends and, but you do learn from mentors or bosses, a lot of things about how you want to form your own approach. Are you a, a mentor to any other administrators or other nursing home leaders? I've done AIT programs with other okay. for over the years. I belong to the New Hampshire Healthcare Association. Somehow I got to be treasurer this year and I don't even know how that <laughs> happened. But I had been president many years ago. Um, I'm part, I'm the president of the Long-Term Care Foundation. And, but I think both of, especially the Healthcare Association, is a great organization that helps mentor leaders through education programs, through activities of the association. It, it gives administrators a voice beyond just their facilities, I think. Um, whether there's some legislative action that we need, 
people to show up and speak at or to have legislator, like, legislators come into your facilities. You know, I think a lot of administrators are a little timid about, they're not timid in their buildings, but public speaking or talking about their business and what they do. It's a profession that we're in that we should be proud of. So helping new leaders understand the value of their profession and how to present themselves in a positive way, because most people don't think highly of nursing homes even to this day. Yet if you work in one, you see the impact you've had on people that's made their lives better. You mentioned the, I'm sorry, you mentioned the New Hampshire Healthcare Association. Healthcare Association. Is, that's a professional organization. Yeah, it's a tra our trade organization. Okay. Yeah. Is that the local chapter of a national? It's part of the American Healthcare Association, okay. um, which is the national association. And one of the things the national association does for us, if, if you're a member of the New Hampshire Healthcare Association, you're a member of American Healthcare, they help collect a lot of those metrics and data points through their long-term care tracker system. So even as a, a private independent provider, I can see how my facilities compare to other facilities in my state on lots of metrics nationally, for-profit, not-for-profit. They have all sorts of ways for you to manipulate your data so you, you can do those comparisons. Because it becomes more and more apparent that if you are going to negotiate with a hospital or negotiate with another, you need to know what your statistics are. For a young person thinking about a career in health, why should they look at long-term care? Because it's not boring and it's, it's exciting. It is, it is the one job that you do everything. You, you do everything as the manager of a facility. You run a business. You run all parts of the business. And that makes your days interesting, exciting, a little crazy sometimes. I'll, I'll, I'll admit to some of those crazy days. Um, but it's, it's the most exciting job I can think of because it's never the same. And you, you have to be able to, to figure out all the pieces to make it work. And there are lots of pieces. If you had to pick one book that an early careerist should read who is aspiring to senior leadership, what would it be? Well, I thought about this one. And what came to my mind first was, oh, The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> because I think what I like about that book is it's such a positive, inspiring, but fun book. And sometimes, some days are just hard. Yeah. And to be able to pull out something that could say, you know, it's not as serious as I think it is, <laughs> you know. And today will pass and tomorrow's a new day. I think that's a fun one. Um, another one, it's not so much about leadership, but I thought was a book that talks about long-term care and how seniors sort of navigate through that process is Knocking on Heaven's Door. It's by Katie, I had to look up the author's name, Katie Butler, and it's a story of her father's process through all of his comorbidities and dementia and the end of life experience. And I think it's, if you're gonna work with the elderly, it's a good lesson. Last question, what kind of training and education should someone pursue if they're thinking about getting into the long-term care field? I think you can come into the long-term care field from almost any bachelor's degree program. If you have in that process <laughs> understanding of some of the healthcare system, that's when you're like when you get licensed there is a core of knowledge checklist. <laughs> so Caregiving is part of it. some understanding of caregiving is in there. Accounting is helpful. <laughs> I had to take accounting. That's when I learned that it's not a science. It's a religion. <laughs> <laughs> that was my take on accounting. But you can, you can pick up all the pieces if you think you have the passion to be a caregiver. I wouldn't limit it to, to having taken a program for it. 
And I would tell you that probably most administrators today didn't necessarily do a health studies program. They went back to school. School. I, I took two courses at UNH to get my license, you know. But you can pick up those pieces if you figure it out that that's what you want to do. And my only recommendation is to find a job in doing something to find out if it is where your passion is. Because you'll see that it's a pretty exciting, dynamic place to work. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community. And we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.